says that it's presented by Betsy Erbach and team. And indeed, a, a large team helped put this service together today. Um, Jess, Jessica Dunn-Safnoff, Melissa, Cynthia, Michael, Colby, Deb, Nick, and Oscar. Um, thanks to, to everyone, all of you who are my team. And um, my comrade Emily is here in the front row and has been working alongside me on these issues that I'm talking about, so I really appreciate all of you being here today. What was your sexual health education like? <laughs> How did you first learn about your body and your own reproductive and sexual health? Did you learn about your body, sex, and sexual health at school? Or mostly from other sources, like friends, peers, your parents, siblings, cousins, other family members, from a book? How about from your church? Mosque, synagogue, temple? These are the questions I ask my students and the people whom I talk to for my social research. The answers matter. Julia Ward Howe, who created the Mother's Day for Peace, advocated for women's participation in democratic decision making on matters that affect women's own well being and the lives of our children, partners, communities, and nation the world. Specifically, she knew that women had a particular vantage on violence and on its alternatives that she thought should be integrated into the big political picture. 150 years later, when I was in graduate school in New Mexico, I had the joy and great good fortune to belong to a vibrant and diverse community of queer women and trans people. This is around the time of Stonewall 25, and we are now at Stonewall 50. The people I knew and loved and studied and organized with created an organization called the Queer Women's Project, funded by the Ms. Foundation, as in Ms. Magazine. For five years, we worked to understand the causes and consequences of violence, specifically intimate partner violence, in our own ethnically diverse queer LGBTQAQQP plus plus and trans community in New Mexico. And we organized to prevent and respond effectively to interpersonal violence in and against our community since the local organizations and institutions were not doing so. In addition to police violence and a general lack of competent services from the local shelters and programs designed to serve the hetero community, we noted a fundamental lack of role models in society for healthy relationships among people of any gender or orientation. And the structural, structural and cultural context of the United States despite Julia Ward Howe's best efforts, still uses violence as its go-to response in the face of nearly every sort of conflict, from the interpersonal to the transnational. Against this backdrop, we held community workshops and meetings to define for ourselves, really starting from scratch, what the characteristics of a healthy relationship are, what promotes that, what, what are barriers to that? What do we do about that? Relationships of all kinds. We worked together to promote healthy relationships of all kinds within our own community, not just between partners, but with our friends, between family members, across the whole community. Ultimately, I wrote my doctoral dissertation in sociology about the Queer Women's Project. Um, and I've published other articles and chapters about that experience and that topic since then. Um, so I, I did graduate with my PhD. I defended my dissertation, uh, very, very pregnant. Um, 
a couple of weeks before Oscar came along. Um, and I've continued to conduct research, teach courses, and build programs with my colleagues that investigate social constructions of gender and sexuality, the causes and consequences of interpersonal violence, cultural violence, structural violence, and what we should do about it. A few years ago, as a lot of you know, I had the honor and privilege of teaching the OWL class with Paul for our youth here in this congregation. OWL stands for Our Whole Lives. It's the comprehensive sexual health curriculum taught in UU and UCC churches and beyond. I'm gonna quote and paraphrase liberally for you from the OWL curriculum about some of its principles. Parents, guardians, educators, and religious communities all face the challenge of creating environments that support and nurture sexual health. Young people need sexuality education programs that model and teach caring, compassion, respect, and justice. Such programs should be holistic, moving beyond the intellect to address the attitudes, values, and feelings that youth have about themselves and the world. The OWL Lifespan Sexuality Education Series was developed by the UU Association and the United Church of Christ Association. And the curriculum that I taught with Paul and with Heidi is designed for seventh to ninth graders, but there are curricula from OWL for kindergarten through second graders, fourth through sixth graders, high school uh, students, college students, adults, and now the newest curriculum is for seniors. It's a lifelong thing this sexuality thing. Um, although OWL was developed by two progressive religious denominations, the program is secular and free of religious references, which you are free to integrate at, you know, as you choose in the UU or UCC tradition. And the underlying values of the program reflect the justice-oriented traditions of both denominations. OWL, our whole lives, is not focused solely on preventing or reducing problems such as high rates of sexually transmitted infection and unintended teen pregnancy. And PSA, teen pregnancy is at a record low and dropping every year, contrary to popular myths, according to the CDC. Um, while OWL equips youth with the knowledge, attitudes, and skills to avoid these consequences, it has the more proactive goal of helping youth to become sexually healthy people who feel good about themselves and their bodies, remain healthy, and build positive, equitable, loving relationships. The program recognizes and respects the diversity of participants with respect to sex, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, disability status, and other dimensions of identity. The activities and language aim to be as inclusive as possible. The program gives clear messages about core sexuality issues organized into four main topics, self-worth, sexual health, responsibility, and justice and inclusivity. And I'm gonna explain each one briefly according to OWL. Number one, self-worth. Every person is entitled to dignity and self-worth and to their own attitudes and beliefs about sexuality. Number two, sexual health. Knowledge of human sexuality is helpful, not harmful. Every person has the right to accurate information about sexuality and to have their questions answered. Healthy sexual relationships are consensual, non-exploitative, mutually pleasurable, safe, developmentally appropriate, based on mutual expectations and caring, and respectful. Number three, responsibility. We are called to enrich our lives by expressing sexuality in ways that enhance human wholeness and fulfillment and that express love, commitment, delight, and pleasure. All persons have the right and obligation to make responsible sexual choices. Number four, justice and inclusivity. We need to avoid double standards. We need to avoid double standards. People of all ages, sexual identities, races, ethnicities, genders, backgrounds, income levels, physical and mental abilities, and sexual orientations must be equally valued and have equal rights. Sexual relationships should never be coercive or exploitative. 
being romantically and sexually attracted to more than one gender, the same gender, another gender, and or to those with a more fluid understanding of their own or other's gender, and, and in addition to all those not experiencing sexual attraction at all, are all natural in the range of human experience. So, after I was trained and spent a year getting here early on Sunday mornings, which you know is a challenge, with my children in tow, and they were younger then, um, to teach the OWL class with Paul and Heidi, after that year, um, I used what I'd learned and gained and uh, to develop a new course at Stockton called Sexualities in Society that essentially combines the OWL curriculum of comprehensive sexual health education with sociological um, gender studies informed sociological study of how gender and sexual identities are socially constructed and how they intersect with race and ethnicity, social class, and disability. So in a sense, where are we now with sexual health, consent, and communication? Where do we want to go and how on earth do we get there? Turns out there's a whole bunch of stuff college students don't know. Um, think back to your own sexual health education, those questions I asked you. Was the sex ed you got comprehensive? Did you learn everything you needed to keep yourself healthy, safe, to make the best choices, to communicate clearly about sex? No? What would have made you and your partner safer, healthier, your relationships stronger? In the US, unlike the rest of the Western industrialized world, we've lived for some time under an abstinence-only sex ed regime, despite all of the evidence uh, saying that's a bad idea. Contrary to popular myth, research evidence indicates that comprehensive sexual health education does not lead people to have sex earlier, more frequently, or with more partners, what it does do is keep people safer and healthier and reduce rates of sexually transmitted infection, unintended pregnancy, and abortion. And yet, we have moved very slowly toward comprehensive sex ed in this country, and under the current administration, we're moving away again. We're going backwards from where all of the evidence says we should be going. One of the important things college students don't know is not everybody's doing it. Studies, many studies have found that high school and college students overestimate how many of their peers have had sex. And if they have had less sexual experience than their peers, they tend to think they're the only one. But copious studies, especially in the age of social media, which has really dramatically affected interaction among young people, personal and uh, internet enhanced, um, uh, Copious studies indicate that a huge proportion of college students have never had sex, but they think they're the only ones. There's also studies of gender in social research methodology about who tends to underreport and who tends to overreport their sexual experience and number of partners by gender. I'll give you one guess how that plays out. <laughs> <clears throat> So this is an example of the sexual double standard. So I do an exercise with my students where I ask them to think about name calling. And if you think about this, you'll, you'll realize you know a lot already about gender and social control. Um, I ask them to think about name calling that involves gendered or sexualized slurs. So think back to the fun times of junior high, middle school, high school. If a girl has insufficient interest in sex, doesn't have sex, or doesn't want to have sex, what is she called? If she has too much interest, too much sex, or too many partners, what is she called? There's a long list, right, that means slut, right? If a boy has insufficient interest in sex or doesn't have sex, what is he called? Pussy, gay, fag, right? These are all words sometimes invoking homophobic slurs, but really they target manhood. And pussy is literally female genitalia, right? So, I mean, 
Emily and I are all, for are all for reclaiming that word and using it in a positive way, but when it's used by boys against each other, we, we know what that means, right? If a boy has too much interest or too much sex, what is he called? So quickly, like you, my students come up with a very long list of names. The board is covered with these, with these names, and it's easy for us all to see that we know a lot about the social policing of gender and the sexual double standard because we all know what these names mean and what they, what they do. These double standards help explain the under and over reporting, right? Um, it becomes part of being a man or becoming a man to exert your power through the way you have sex and through having sex, right? And it becomes part of being or becoming the right kind of girl to avoid thinking, talking about, expressing interest in having sex or wearing whatever the hell you want on any given day, right? So here's the real confounding question. If boys are telling each other they're having lots of sex with girls, but none or very few of the girls are having sex, do the math. Okay, so. <clears throat> so, you may know that since last summer, Stockton, where many of us work, is being sued by nine students for violations of Title IX. These are students, nine of them, who were sexually assaulted and who say the Stockton staff and administration did not help them. Nine students who say this and have been so frustrated by this response of the institution to their situation that they are suing. You may also know that failure to take sexual harassment and assault seriously is a national crisis, and that as with sex education under the current administration, we're moving in the wrong direction with sexual harassment and assault prevention and response. Namely, Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos has moved to uh, undo through policy and um, dear colleague letters and other orders uh, to undo many of the advances that were made under the Obama administration at, at be basically because of student activism. Obama took leaps forward and DeVos and Trump are undoing a lot of that. And she is specifically taking steps to protect accused perpetrators of rape and sexual assault. These policies come straight out of what scholars refer to as rape culture. Rape culture is defined as an environment in which rape is prevalent and in which sexual violence against women is normalized and excused in the media and popular culture. So the United States and virtually every college campus has a rape culture. And evidence shows that fraternities are among the social environments most frequently conducive to rape culture. Sociologist Lisa Wade wrote an article in Time Magazine recently called Why Colleges Should Get Rid of Fraternities for Good. So you can see where she stands. She writes, beginning in the 1800s, that young rich men invented social fraternities to isolate themselves from their middle class peers, thumb their nose at the religious values of their professors, and wrest control away from administrators who set their schedules, curriculum, and objectives. They came to prominence during the period of widespread and largely forgotten campus violence at a time when militias were commonly called in to tamp down riots led by students armed with pistols and flame. The young rich men to whom fraternities appealed were nothing short of a menace. Until the mid 1800s and in some cases until the turn of the century, university presidents, presidents tried valiantly but unsuccessfully to close fraternities down. Fraternity men consolidated power by placing their own members in every conceivable position of authority on campus, from college politics to scholarships, leadership positions, and awards. And here we are. Fraternities have continued ever since to consolidate social and political power on and off campus, disproportionately among elite white men, straight men. And when they get in too much trouble, when their rampant racism, sexism, and violence becomes too extreme or visible, or a pledge's life is threatened or ended, 
because of their activities. They lose their affiliation with their national organization or with the campus, and then they go underground and become unaffiliated. And now, as on many campuses, an unaffiliated fraternity is at the center of Stockton's Title IX problems. So my colleagues and I, who study and teach about these issues as our vocation, as our calling, have held teaching circles, hours upon hours upon hours of meetings with, our, with each other, with our students, with the administration, with staff of, the, of the, the campus. And this year, I am chairing a task force on sexual and gender-based violence at Stockton to further study and report on this issue to our faculty senate and the administration. And looking back on the activism and, and scholarship we've been doing on this at Stockton, beginning six years ago, six years ago, well before the lawsuits, uh, we were naive. And we thought if we studied and pointed out these problems to the university with plenty of good evidence and scholarly citations and evidence straight from students, they would immediately address these issues and follow our expert recommendations. So we created a teaching circle and we met for two years and produced a paper about the state of sexual assault prevention and response at Stockton. The administration said thank you and put it in a filing cabinet. After the lawsuits started last summer, the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies faculty of Stockton immediately began holding meetings again and writing letters and uh, you know, addressing the president, the board of trustees, the administration, and staff of Stockton about the problems and what should be done, particularly about the problem of unaffiliated fraternities and the red zone, a period of six weeks that is the most dangerous time for campus sexual assault. More than 50% of campus sexual assaults occur between August and November. Uh, these months are often filled with, you know, booze-filled back-to-school parties where uninformed first-year students uh, with little drinking experience and few trusted friends to watch out for them are especially vulnerable. And we knew from our students and from our own conversations over the years that a specific unaffiliated fraternity posed a real threat to women on campus. Some of you, I think, have been neighbors with their, um, the, the frat house they rented off campus. So when the university's knowledge of and lack of action about the unaffiliated fraternity led to this heap of lawsuits, we insisted on full disclosure to the community of the risks posed, especially to first year students. And we went back and forth with the administration, and they finally granted WIG's faculty, Women's Gender Studies faculty, uh, permission to attend and observe freshman orientation. And we were, we were told that students would be informed about the risks, and we were horrified to see uh, members of the administration tell students not about the unaffiliated fraternities or the dangers of toxic masculinity and how not to rape women, but mainly to avoid getting too drunk and getting themselves raped, basically. So these are messages straight out of rape culture, right? Um, rape culture is perpetuated uh, not only through the use of misogynistic language, object objectification of women's bodies, and glamorization of sexual violence, but also by blaming the victim, trivializing assault, um, defining manhood as dominant, sexually aggressive, defining womanhood as submissive and sexually passive, putting pressure on women to score and pressure on women to not appear distant, cold, or to smile, right? Telling women all the time to smile is part of that, right? Assuming only promiscuous women get raped, assuming that men don't get raped or that only weak men are assaulted. Um, refusing to take rape accusations seriously, and finally, teaching women to avoid getting raped instead of teaching men not to rape. And some of the expressions of rape culture are more insidious. Um, so I, I think about my grandma who used to say I should sit in a ladylike way, right? Um, and 40 years later at Cecile's kindergarten orientation, I heard about the kindergarten dress called for five-year-olds about not wearing straps on a sundress that were too narrow. And I was, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe we were still having this conversation. Um, 
Another example is you can think about how American culture has treated Bill Clinton versus how it has treated Monica Lewinsky. She was 22 years old at the time that we all heard of her. And finally, last Tuesday in Northfield, where I live, a man assaulted a 28-year-old woman on Tuesday afternoon this past week as she jogged through Birch Grove Park. And police advice for those who use the park was keep in mind to exercise in groups of two or more in isolated areas or use well-traveled areas. So we're supposed to move around in groups. Um, they gave the same advice a couple of years ago when a very similar thing happened in the same park. So ironically, when my colleagues and I work together with our students who are survivors and activists and speak out, we are resisted, we are retaliated against, we are told to be quiet and not bring you know, a bad name to the university. And we find ourselves coming up again against an institution that is designed to keep us isolated and quiet. <clears throat> and respectability politics and talk of civility is used to um, keep us from talking openly about these issues and acknowledging that they're very serious, deeply held cultural problem. And so coming back to the double standard, um, I've been wrestling lately with a new level of daily confrontation between my own identity as a mother and a scholar and an activist with my professional environment and the institution to which I've committed my professional time, both Stockton and academia in general. <clears throat> and the student survivors and activists and the faculty survivors and activists and staff and um, everyone in the Stockton community who's responding uh, we are responding not just to the violence and to the lack of appropriate response still from our university, but we're responding to our own fear. I feel fear lately about speaking out because I'm supposed to. My colleagues and students have been threatened and retaliated against for speaking about this violence. <clears throat> And for women who confront rape culture on campus and speak up and hold the institution accountable, there is real fear about job security. But more insidious and probably arguably more dangerous is the fear of making white men in power angry. And rape culture is designed to instill this particular kind of fear. White supremacy, misogyny, and patriarchy are all designed collectively to do this. But as a white, middle-class woman with tenure, <clears throat> thanks team, I find that I'm stepping back and really looking at and thinking about this fear and asking myself, where does this fear come from? And honestly, so what? What if I make them mad? What if, what if they think I'm a bitch? This is another one of those names women get called when they're out of line. And as um, Amy Poehler and Tina Fey say, bitch is the new black. <clears throat> as Audre Lorde, black socialist, lesbian feminist poet and activist says, some problems we share as women, some we do not. You, meaning white women, Fear your children will grow up to join the patriarchy and testify against you. We, meaning women of color, fear our children will be dragged from a car and shot down in the street, and you will turn your backs on the reasons they are dying. So, <clears throat> I think that based on what being an anti-racist, feminist, queer you, you, and what teaching OWL has taught me about self-worth Responsibi responsibility, justice, and inclusivity, that it is my job to confront the fear and to do it anyway. So finally, <clears throat> as I was preparing to give this talk, 
Earlier this week, something happened that I have to share with you because you're my team. In my wild queer pre-kid grad school days in New Mexico, I had a good friend named Katie Schneier. Katie and I were both feminist activists for reproductive justice and against gendered violence. Katie and her sister had both had kind of rough lives as kids. And when Katie was in her late teens, her sister gave birth to a baby boy. Her sister was struggling as a young single mama and Katie agreed to help raise baby Omar. It wasn't easy. By the time I met Katie in grad school, Omar was in elementary school and he would regularly stay with her along with his little brother, Miles. And we all watched them grow into these amazing, sweet, loving young men and supported Katie in her role as a very loving and very involved aunt. So this past Friday, I was sitting at Stockton's graduation ceremony at Boardwalk Hall, waiting for my students to cross the stage and pick up their diplomas. And in the middle of the ceremony, I learned that Katie's nephew, Omar, age 20, was accidentally shot and killed on Thursday. So my whole Albuquerque women's and trans community is in shock and grief. And yesterday, Katie wrote something on Facebook, and I asked her if I could share it with you, and she said yes. She says, I don't know how to do this, but I'm doing it. Omar made me an aunt. He made me Nene. There was my life before him and my life after. He literally saved my life as a depressed adolescent dealing with my own history when he was born. Suddenly life was bigger than what was in my own head, my own suffering. I was Omar's Nene, and I needed to stay around, heal, and make meaning so I could see what happened with this incredible being and help light a path for him. Now he is gone, and he is everywhere, never with me and always with me. How do people do this? It's impossible and yet the only real option is to keep going. I keep welcoming your prayers as I walk along with my family into this place. So I told Katie I would request your thoughts and prayers for Katie and for Miles and for their family, so thank you. And on behalf of Katie and my friends and my colleagues and my students and my children, all of our children, thank you for being my team. Thank you for this community. Thank you for your support of me through tenure and everything else. Thank you for your commitment and your work to creating a world where all young people of all genders and sexualities, races and ethnicities can survive into adulthood and live healthy, whole lives. Thank you for your donations to Black Mama's Bailout. <clears throat> And thank you in advance for helping to build consent culture in our community and our world. Blessed be. <clears throat>